we can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's it's five percent of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here. We're back. It's Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. My guest today is Jimmy Kennedy, who is the assistant coach at Northwestern. But I got to tell you, I grew up in Illinois in the early 2000s, as did Jimmy. And this guy was a legend. Multiple times state and national champ as a kid. Fargo champ. And just the guy had a an aura about him. There were rumors about this kid. That's how good he was. And he took it all the way to the highest level. He was a U.S. Open champ, a world team member. And I just really enjoyed this conversation with Jimmy, and I hope you do too. Now, for past episodes, please visit WrestlingChangeMyLife.org. And thank you for tuning in, folks. Peace! Jimmy Kennedy, welcome to the podcast, man. How are you? Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate you having me on. So, for the listeners here who didn't grow up in Illinois, Jimmy Kennedy was an absolute stud as a kid. And, Jimmy, i got to let you know a little secret. In my friend group, you know, there was always rumors about what your uh, what your dad did as a living. Some of my friends said your dad was a teacher. Some said he was a, a businessman with a private play, and that's how he got all the tournaments together. So let's just set the record straight. <laughs> First and foremost yeah. here, man, what'd your old man do for a living? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I wish I wish he had the private plane, but he was a teacher. So uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the kind of money to afford that. Uh, we, we'd be out at Tulsa, man. The kids would be like, there goes Jimmy Kennedy, man. Yeah, his dad flew him here. And I go, what? Craziness. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know, man. Good to know. It, now, just kind of take us back. I know you're at Northwestern now doing a lot of great things there. Mm-hmm. And you made a world team you know, for the Cliff Keen Club. But kind of take us back to uh, to your youth. And you know, how did you get involved with wrestling? And you know, what do you think enabled you to have such a successful career early on? Um, so I, it was a family sport. My uncles wrestled. So uh, I got started at a pretty young age, around four or five was when I started going to practices. And uh, the rest is history. It was one week after another wrestling tournament. Wrestling tournament. Um, so that's basically how I, how I got into it. You know, I wanted to ask you about this because you wrestled mm-hmm. so much as a youth. Like, well, how do you think mm-hmm. about, I know you just had a son. Like, how do you think mm-hmm. about the balance of like, pushing your kids real hard, but also giving them like the support they need. Like, was your dad real hard on you or did he kind of let you run at your own pace and you just loved it and started going with it because you were everywhere, man. You were at Reno, you were yeah. at Tulsa, you did it all at a young age. Yeah. No, um, at times it was, uh, it was pretty intense. And, uh, growing up, there were times where I, I didn't want to continue anymore because there's so much pressure for a young kid, uh, especially if you experience success at an early, early age. Um, it's, uh, it's pressure that you put on yourself. Um, it's pressure that family and friends have on you, whether or not that pressure actually exists, but as a kid, most, most people aren't equipped to deal with it. And, um, I think what helped me was we didn't go 365. We hit a couple tournaments during the summer, but I think when I was younger, um, wrestled a lot during the season and then had a couple months where, You know, I was doing football, I was golfing, I was playing tennis. I was out doing other things instead of just only wrestling. And maybe that's a way to reset and and stay fresh for the season. Um, Maybe it's not, but I think think, uh, in order to be good at this sport, 
the pressure cannot be external. It's got, it's got to be your own. You got to want to do it. You can't have someone else want that for you. And, uh, it, it, it's, it's tough to push your kid without pushing him too much and, and burning him out. And I think that would be something that I take as I go with my son, you know, if, if he wants to wrestle great, if he doesn't, uh, that's a different story. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I hope he does it. It's, at times, probably not the most enjoyable sport. You know, I'd rather be playing a game than, than <laughs> freaking doing bike sprints. But uh, uh, I think it teaches you a lot about yourself. And, you know, I, I hope that one day he is in that position, in the same position that I was growing up. Yeah, I think a lot of wrestlers feel that way. I mean, you're looking back now, I'm 30 years old. I imagine you're like 32, 31, somewhere in there. Um, yeah, 31. Yeah, it's like looking back, you're like, man, what a great time that was and how thankful mm-hmm. are we all that we did it, you know? But at the time, yeah, there's some there's some really tough moments, especially with the weight cutting. That seems to yeah. to put a, yeah. kind of a black cloud on things. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think everyone hopes their kid's involved with it. Um, yeah. How old were you when you started feeling some of those pressures? Uh, it was pretty early on. Um, you know, you, you have the – when you start at that young of an age, you, you run into a lot of the same people week in and week out. And then you start to develop a little rivalry. And I think as a kid, I was very competitive, even when I was really young. Maybe that's what helped me get to the point I am now. Um, mm-hmm. But that but I put a lot of pressure on myself. And I, I, I feared losing uh, almost more than I appreciated winning. And I think when there's that, that balance, it makes it tough to, to enjoy until you have the, the maturity to get, to deal with that kind of pressure. So it was, it was pretty early on. I think once I started uh, my, my first or second year, probably second or third year is when I really started to feel the pressure. Wow. A bit more. That's, that's super young. Yeah. I thought you were going to say like middle school, but you're talking like way before that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just didn't want to lose, so, ever. (laughs) I don't know if most people feel like that um, at a young age, but um, I knew I I didn't want to lose, and I worked hard, so uh, I expected to win, and um, I don't, I don't necessarily say, I'm not necessarily saying pressure's a bad thing, Uh, it's gonna, it's gonna be there regardless. but uh, yeah, no, it, it, it was pretty early on. And when did you kind of fast forwarding? When did you realize that you know my goal is to to make an Olympic or world team, and this is what you wanted to do all through college? Yeah, I really didn't have those goals growing up. Um, I was very uh, just focused on the primary goal as a kid, winning a state title, winning national titles. Um, high school, winning a state title, winning Fargo, you know, college, college, I anticipated winning a national title and walking away from the sport entirely. Um, and maybe that's why I continued to wrestle because I felt like I had a lot left in me to prove to myself and, you know, to the wrestling community and to, to give back. Um, so had I won a national title as a, uh, college wrestler, I, I, might not have continued. I, I might have, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I really can't answer that. Um, so it was really year to years. You know, I I didn't have the goal to be an Olympian as a as a kid because I don't know. I just didn't have it. my goal was was year to year. I I guess no yep. one uh, told me to have that ten year goal. Um, What's and maybe as a kid? What were you gonna say? I was just going to say that, you know, sometimes people say that just to feel like they have to say it. I mean, some people really do have that goal. I can remember yeah. like, Tony Ramos at a young age at Fargo. His mom told me that, and I'm like, I actually believe them, like, no question in mind. Some people say it just to say it, though. So, like, for you to actually say, hey, man, I never even thought about that. I think a lot of people yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, I remember I did uh, an article where I was in the news with a guy who wrestled on my team. Um, and he said that was his goal and, you know, he was good, but I might've been a couple levels better than him. And I remember thinking that's his goal. Well, that's not my goal. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. If, 
I don't know if it was actually his or it was just like, you know, what what you're expected to say. But um, but yeah, that that was that was just my perspective. And one of the things I was hoping to cover was the transition into college for you, because as we've mentioned, you know, multiple times state champ as a kid. You know, you won Fargo mm-hmm. in high school, won two state titles. Um, you know, once you got to college. I'm sure you went through both ups and downs. I'd love to hear what it was like for you kind of transitioning from mm-hmm. the high school ranks all through college and maybe some of the lows, some of the highs and how you, how you got through them. Yeah. Yeah. Coming in, uh, I think I had the same, you know, worries on what that college room is going to be like, because you hear stories from, you know, former coaches or former athletes that they don't get a takedown for months, months into the season. So, um, I didn't think that I would be in that situation. Uh, but uh, I remember wrestling a guy, his name was Jim Comfort. He was maybe a fifth year. I was a true freshman. And I think I got the first, first takedown. And uh, it was not an easy one. Um, we ended up scrambling around for 30, 45 seconds, and I was exhausted. And uh, I think that was the biggest uh, transition for me was those first couple of weeks just building up that that cardio and stamina to, to wrestle comp- someone competitively for an hour and a half to two hours for a practice. I think he, he got like eight, eight takedowns on me the, the next um, five or ten <laughs> minutes or how, however long that go was. So I was just, I was wiped. I was crushed. Um, but, you, you know, when you're wrestling in a high school room, there's maybe one or two guys that can push you. When you make that jump to, to a room of college athletes who have been training full time for, for, you know, two, three, four years, uh, everyone's pretty competitive right when you walk into the room at least. And, um, and, and that was a big transition. And what, once you build that, that base where you know what to expect and, uh, you know, your, your strength is, is improving your, your cardio, your wrestling, your position, um, all that stuff kind of comes together. Um, so I, I, I remember that after that first takedown, thinking holy cow we said you know practice is just getting started and uh that one wasn't easy <laughs> everyone's heard that right that that, that statement you're not going to score a takedown for your first month or, or even worse you're not going to get to get out from bottom for x number of months. yeah yeah I, I think i think uh you know there's bits and bits of truth to that um but you can either listen to that and or you could say hey, screw that i'm gonna go get the takedown right away or you know, I'm not going to get rid now. Um, and I think those are probably the guys that that see the most success in college are the ones that um, rise up to that as a challenge versus uh, uh, backing down and kind of going with the grain. Well, especially now that you're a coach at Northwestern, uh, how many years have you been there? This will be uh, my second year. So last year, uh, September was when I started. I mean, it must be interesting to see that from the lens of being a coach and seeing you know, your first class of freshmen come in and kind of see what they go through and who's going to make it through those first couple of months and who's not. I mean, what are you looking for yeah. among athletes when you're out in the road? Because I'm sure everyone tells you they want to be a four-time national champ, but like, what are you looking for to try and weed out those guys who are going to have the persistence to make it all through, make it through all those years? Yeah, I think uh, looking for guys who, who um, rise up when a match starts to get tough because anyone can wrestle well when things are going their way. Um, but uh, it's the guys that when things aren't going their way, still find a way to win or battle back. Um, not showing a lot of emotion on their face. I mean, excited, whatever, that's fine. But you know, you can't have that disheartened uh, crying look on your face when, you know, you give up a takedown that maybe shouldn't have been a takedown. So I think it's just a lot of, um, maturity and uh in will to win you know will to work once it gets tough because you know you can win a lot of matches in college if you're just tough um and that's the toughest thing to teach is is toughness um some guys have it some guys don't some guys you know maybe don't have it initially but become tough and um i think that's probably one of the biggest difficulties coaching is is building that toughness and telling these kids to have a, a screw it attitude. If, if someone wants to uh, 
stand in the middle and fucking oops, oh, sorry, sorry for swearing. You can swear. Fight, That's uh, all right. <laughs> uh, no, we, we can say whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, the guys that uh, the guys that really uh, don't back away from the challenge. I think I think that's a big difference maker uh, in in the college room. I mean, that's true for obviously for all walks of life, but like just having the the will to persist when things aren't going your way seems to be a common right. theme of what people have taken away from the sport. And I'm just curious on if you found a good way yet to kind of suss that out when you're on these recruiting trips, because. Again, if you're recruiting someone, most of the time they're telling you what you want to hear versus how do you re- – not mm-hmm. that they're intentionally aligned, but maybe they just – they don't realize how hard it is. I mean, we had Chris Perry yeah. on here two weeks ago, and he was saying like he legitimately thought he could be an NCAA champ as freshman year. But then looking back, his senior year, he's like, dude, no way in hell was I even ready. Um, yeah. Not even close. You know, so it's interesting to hear mm-hmm. how different coaches like you or Perry or Paulson try and understand – try and pick that out, you know, from a kid. Yeah. Like, is it their – high school credentials is it kind of their parents is it just something you pick up when you're meeting with them have you been able to pinpoint it yet no um i don't think there's a, a formula or anything um i actually just began uh or just moved up from the volunteer position to the assistant position and as a volunteer okay. i can't really interact with, uh, with the high school guys as much um okay. when they're on campus that's one thing but so I'm I'm really new to the recruiting. Uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy conversing with the guys and you know getting to know these these kids as individuals. Um, but yeah, I I I still think uh, you could see it in matches. You could see it on their face. Um, you could you could pick up little signs um, when you're when you're talking with kids and it's just reading people, trying to trying to understand them. Um, not at their surface level, but but what really motivates them, you know, are they, do they, do they really want to win or are they just telling you they want to win? Um, right. And so I'm still learning. Uh, you know, this is, this is only my first um, batch of kids that, that I'm reaching out to and, and talking with. So I'm sure if you, if we had the same conversation next year, I might have a whole different thing I'm looking for. Yeah. I actually forgot that the volunteer assistants don't get out in the road. Um, but yeah, I, I I would be curious to hear how that is because I can imagine it's got to be one of the most important parts of being a college coach for sure is the recruiting, but also one of the most fun. I mean, if you actually find the kid you want, they want to go to your school and you meet them in maybe a summer after their junior year and you work with them all the way through you know, until they come to your school and then if they become an All-American National Champ, I mean, that's a really tight bond you have and I would just imagine that's got to be one of the most rewarding parts of, of being a coach is kind of seeing that whole process through it. Yeah. And I haven't even had a full year with guys that I've recruited. Um, and so it, 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 it's a pleasure to develop the relationships with the guys and then see them succeed on the mat. And, and uh, I think that's the most rewarding piece of coaching um, that, that I've experienced so far. Uh, and having those tight relationships with these guys where they look up to you and, you know, you're, you want them to be a better wrestler, but if you can make them better men, then everything else will come a little more easily than uh, if you're only focused on their wrestling. Right. And and they'll be able to see that through as well. They'll kind of see through that and like there'll be more trust there if they, if if you have their their best interest in mind, because we've all been with a coach where you, you feel like they do have your best interest or they don't. Um, yeah, and one of one of the coaches that's had a huge role in your life uh, through high school and then to the Christine Athletic Club is Sean Borme. Maybe talk mm-hmm. about you know what did you learn from him, and now that you're a coach, like what are some things you're applying that, that you picked up from him over the years? Uh, I think I think um, Sean's a, Sean's a tough one to read. He's uh, there's times where you'll think he's happy with you, and then there's times where. Uh, He's, I, I don't know if he's messing with me, um, but uh, he, he's a great guy. He, he cares about you. Uh, he cares about everyone on the team. And being there with him, um, I saw that guys that weren't starting, he's, he's coming up to and asking them how their day is. You know, there's, there's, I'm assuming a lot of college coaches, high school coaches, grade school coaches that aren't like that. They only care about their breadwinner. Um, 
and uh, he's definitely not one of those guys. And uh, he he's very knowledgeable about the sport and um, very analytical when it comes to the way he manages uh, the room and the way he coaches. And I think I think all those little pieces I, I've kind of picked and chosen from um, watching his demeanor when he's demonstrating technique or running practice. Uh, mm-hmm. Just all, all great things, and um, that's why I've always really appreciated Sean. Actually, a funny story. Uh, when I was younger, I was in eighth grade or seventh grade. Um, didn't really know him that much. Uh, I think uh, Marty Ingwall. I don't know if you remember that name. Yeah, I um, do. He went to Providence, right? Yeah, his dad and my dad were close, and his dad was uh, talking Sean up because I think they were, yeah, they were from that Tinley area, and Sean started off in Tinley, and. Uh, <laughs> Two weeks later, my dad shot me off on Sean's doorstep, and uh, I found out later that this was a week after Sean got married, so I just got back from the honeymoon, and sure enough, I'm getting dropped off on his doorstep, and <laughs> he was cool with it. You know, he trained me for a week, uh, went to the overtime facility with him in the morning, was there all the way uh, throughout the day, coming home at 8 or 9 o'clock at night, um, but that just shows you what kind of guy he is. He, Sean saw something in me early and um, was willing to invite me into his home and and, and help me help me out at an early age. Uh, Wait, so you you like, stayed at the house like in addition to going to the practices like during the week? Yeah, my dad just dropped me off at his house and uh, for like a little <laughs> training camp because it was like two hours away from our house. So Sean Sean allowed that. I don't know why. Um, and. Uh, uh yeah he took me all the practices um basically helped me help help me out for for that week um it was almost like a training camp my own my own private training camp were there other guys there was it just you staying with them uh it's just me oh my god (laughs) how uh maybe that awkward but like man that's kind of that that's awesome that he did that i mean especially a week after getting married you know, now that uh, yeah, you're well, I, married, I, and... I didn't know all that. <laughs> I didn't know all that until uh, Sean was talking about the story. Because um, as as a younger kid, I'm, you know, I'm used to being dropped off for training camps or going right. away for two, two national tournaments back to back. So right. this didn't seem that bizarre to me at the time. And then uh, hearing Sean tell the story when we're out in Michigan, um, I found out it was a week or two after he got married. Uh, in his life. <laughs> Wife is an amazing lady, and she she uh, she was cool with it. She didn't uh, she didn't cut it off right then and there. So that's good. That's good. I mean, now that we're yeah. uh, you know old enough, where I think you're married, and I, you know I have a girlfriend, but I can only imagine it'd be a tough conversation to have a week after you get married to say, "Hey, this middle school kid's gonna come live with us for a week. I think he's gonna be really good." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I'm sure my wife would be cool with it. Um, but, you know, if you don't know the sport and how crazy it can be at times, I'm, I'm sure there's a, a lot of people that might put their foot down. Exactly. Do you have any other stories from those overtime days? I mean, those rooms were loaded back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, every practice was tough. It, you know, you're getting the can't even imagine. The yeah, day yeah. in and day out. Um, the biggest thing I remember was it was a, it was a hike for us. It was because we, we'd have to leave and we'd be sitting in the rush hour traffic. So uh, to Naperville, it was an hour and a half to, to two and a half hours. Um, and th- those are long days. You know, you get home from school, you immediately leave, and then you're not getting home until 10 o'clock at night. But I think that's, you know, that's, it was a little different back then because there weren't a ton of wrestling opportunities um, close by. Like there's, right. there's, there's, there's so many options for kids to choose from nowadays back then you know there was overtime um and that was really it I I don't really think there are that many clubs especially during the summer um but I think it's a little different now you got you got Puertas you got Izzy you got uh 312 you got all these little programs scattered around so it's a it's a, a little easier to um find something close by nowadays it's un- it's unbelievable actually the the business of the the academies I think it's great I mean there's so many full time jobs around here now just training kids if you look at other yeah. sports like soccer or or hockey like that's been going on for a while so I think it's awesome all the it's got to make yeah. uh, you know the college recruiting a little bit easier because like you can pinpoint these academies 
Yeah. Yeah, no, it, uh, it definitely does. You, you find where some good guys are coming out of and uh, hopefully develop a relationship and see if there's something you like and you could foster that uh, with, when, when you guys start recruiting. So um, right. I'm starting to, to see that a little bit more since, since that's one of my obligations. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy now how, how much – opportunity there is for kids uh in the, within the sport and i think you you see it now you look at all these young young wrestlers having success at an international level um it has to be because of little little things like this yeah absolutely i mean it's awesome to see what those teams are doing um mm -hmm. and speaking of you know world teams i know you made a world team and I think I read somewhere that it was maybe the highlight of your career. So I'd love to spend a little bit of time there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like going into that, that tournament, mm -hmm. you know, how do you prepare? You know, physically, I think everyone knows kind of the preparations, but how did you think about the mental preparation? Did you, like, what was your self-talk like? Or did you visualize a lot going into that? Maybe talk us through that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was, I was dialed in. I was um, completely, focused on winning a world title and I 100% believed that I could and uh there was no doubt in my mind um going into the tournament I was excited I was I was cutting a lot of weight so uh now is this was for the world championships or the trial tournament uh for both really um, okay okay so let's start at the trial tournament because go you had never made a world team before that right right I won the U.S. Okay. Open that year so I had, I had a buy uh, okay. To the finals, so there's a mini tournament before me. Um, yep. And a lot, and a lot of this, I think, may have negatively affected me at, at the World Championships because, um, because of the weight cut and the fact that I had, you know, over 24 hours to to feel good and and get my legs back underneath me for that trial. I was kind of misled when the World Championships came around. Um, make weight at 5 p.m. and I'm wrestling at 10 a.m. My, I just, I didn't have the same pop and the same, same uh, strength okay. that I had at those trials and U.S. Open events. So it was, it was, a, it was a tough cut, but, um, you know, I, I expected to win and just some things didn't go my way and that wasn't the case, but um, I, I, I would have loved another opportunity to wrestle in the world championships. I, I just, uh, it's, it's tough to make a team, you know, mm -hmm. the U S is good. I mean, definitely. Now, now leading up to the trials tournament, you know, you have what, six to eight weeks between the U S open and the trials. Mm -hmm. are, what, are you spending time like each day specifically visualizing or is it just something you kind of did naturally, like going to and from practice? Yeah, it's, it's something I did naturally. Um, you know, I don't know if it's always good or if it's bad, but you you lay awake at night and you're wrestling matches in your head. And I guess it hurts you when you can't fall asleep, but maybe you get reps in that way. Maybe that's the difference maker. Uh, it's right. Visualizing yourself getting that takedown, um, which I tend to do that accidentally a lot because, I don't know, it's it's on my mind. And then next thing you know, it's – 12 o'clock at night and I'm trying to turn it off. So, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if uh, that's necessarily a good thing, but um, you, you get a lot of that visualization done uh, going to practice or reflecting upon practice. Um, getting that, that uh, your, your mentality primed for, for live matches coming up. Um, if you're in a simulation week, and I think a lot of that is just built in the training itself. Um, okay. But, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, there's been times. I don't know if, if you have experienced that as well, where you're laying, laying in bed at night and thinking about certain things, and then next thing you know, your, your brain's running and you can't, you can't get, get to sleep. Dude, I tell you, it happens to me now because, you know, with this, uh, with this podcast, I'm actually doing a, are you familiar with like the 30 for 30 concept like 30 for 30 is an espn yeah 
Yeah, I love those, right? So I'm doing a, uh, putting together right now an audio, a five-part audio documentary series on Dan Gable right now. It hasn't been released yet, but but so like part one is high high school and through college, and part two is the loss to Larry Owings, part three is the Olympics, and then part four and five are coaching. And so, you know, kind of building this out of my head all the time, right? And I have a day job as well. And so at night, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about this shit constantly to, to your point last night i was laying there looking at my phone it's like 1205 and i have a little notebook yeah. a notepad by my bed stand and I, I just have to write this stuff down otherwise i literally cannot go to sleep so you know i can yeah. only imagine i don't really remember it as much as a wrestler but um i was never on the same level as you so i can imagine you know yeah. it's probably similar right you literally can just not go to sleep <laughs> it's so frustrating but yeah. at the same time it's fun fun to think about it you know yeah, yeah, thinking about attacks or different ways to set things up, um, doing the reps in your head and, uh, you know, experiment, experimenting like that. And that was something I did a lot. Unfortunately, it was at night. And, um, but, you know, it was, it, uh, it was there nonetheless. Now, w- did you have any specific, like, techniques to kind of eradicate self-doubt if that crept in? Because I know a lot of athletes that can happen to as well when they're laying there and they start going down a if then scenario and it's, like, worst-case stuff versus versus kind of, like, what yeah. you want to happen. Did you ever deal with that? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've had – I definitely uh, doubted myself before or thought, like, man, this is going to be tough. How, how am I going to um, – how am I going to win? How am I going get to jo- get the job done? Um, and I think as soon as you notice those thoughts, uh, starting to build up in your head, that's when you got to start talking or thinking about your strong suits, you know, what, what you're good at, what you're going to do to make sure that these negatives don't, don't transpire. Um, and that's kind of what I did. If it got really bad, if, if I was maybe, maybe had a couple rough practices in a row, or had a bad tournament, and I'm, you know, feeling sorry for myself. I would start to write in a in a journal, uh, all the little things that I'm doing, all the little things that that I'm good at, all the big things I'm good at, um, and then and then building upon that, and uh, in the practice room, and that that helped eliminate any any significant doubts that I ever had. I love that because I keep a journal now and I've only been doing it in my later years, but never in college. Like, where'd you pick that up from? And like, what would you write about and how often would you do it? Um, I didn't do it a ton. I did it, uh, you know, the, like towards the end of the season. Um, I just wanted to make sure I was doing everything I could to, to, yeah. to make sure, you know, I was putting myself in a position to win. Um, so it wasn't like something I did every day. It was, uh, I remember um, I made the university world team and uh, went out to Finland, had a pretty bad tournament, um, was kind of a little PO'd at myself, a um, little bit of doubt in my head because it was my first first or second international tournament. And um, my first one was Ukraine, lost my first match uh, to a guy that I beat pretty easily in practice matches, got caught in like a role and then and then pinned pretty quickly. Um, so I hadn't, I hadn't had much success. Went out to university world team or uh, world championships and uh, same thing. You know, I won my first one, then lost my second one. That guy lost, I was out. Uh, but it was a double tournament. Um, I was wrestling in Grazny, Russia, which was a pretty, pretty tough Russian tournament a couple weeks later. And every day after that tournament, I was writing in a journal, writing in a diary that I'm the best, I'm the strongest, I'm the fastest. Um, no one can beat me. And, uh, I ended up winning, um, some good matches. I beat Chikai up there who took third at this, this last world championships, uh, at 65 kilos, um, ended up finishing in bronze. I lost to, uh, Alexander Bogomayev in the semi. Um, and that was, that was one instance where, where I really, uh, implemented that and, and did that, uh, every day strict regimen if, if I was ever uh, thinking negative thoughts I'm, I'm writing in that, that journal I'm the best no one can be me um, I've got a great sing, single leg great double leg just little things even even if uh, you don't 100% believe it um, 
you know, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's, it's only gonna help you. It's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt you. I love hearing those stories because, man, that must have been a, you know, big, a, a big moment of self-reflection for you, right? Because you're overseas, and I'm guessing you didn't come back in between the two tournaments, right? You stayed over there for that whole time. Yeah, yeah, stayed over there. So wrestled in Finland, um, had that poor tournament, and then was wrestling in Russia maybe a week and a half later. So. You know, I was I was um, really doubting myself after that performance, and uh, and I, I'm like, I got to change up my training. I'm doing something wrong. I'm I'm not winning. I don't I don't know what's happening. Um, and then there was one comment that really sticks in my my mind. And uh, Bill Zadek said to us because our our university world can didn't really do that well. He said, "There's no reason you cannot learn and still win at the same time," and that really resonated with me. You know, um, as a as a young international or not young, I'm I'm post college, yeah. but young for myself. I hadn't I hadn't done freestyle wrestling full time, but um, that really resonated with me because I I was thinking these guys have been doing this their whole life. These are Russians, you know, putting them up on a pedestal, and yeah. then to have someone say that to me that you could still improve and win at the same time. Um, that stuck, and uh, and I think it changed my attitude when I when I when I shook hands with those guys because I was no longer expecting to lose because I'm still learning. I was expecting to win, you know, and I could still learn at that same time. And uh, my mindset was completely switched. And ever since that tournament, I think I placed in all but maybe two two or three tournaments um, the following five years, international and domestically. So I think that was wow. a big, a big, uh, a big, big training block for me that just that, that little um, saying in my head. And the, cr- the crazy thing is that like your skill didn't get any better between that week and a half, you know, and that tournament, mm-hmm. but it was just like a mental thing. And so yeah. I- I'm always yeah. just amazed by how much or how influential, like the conversation we have with ourselves uh, is. And especially now that you're coaching, like, man, like, if you could just relay that to your kids and like, get get through to them mentally, I mean, that would be so effective. I mean, it's just it's just amazing yeah. to me to hear those stories, you know. Yeah, and I can I can really pinpoint uh, the period in in that one match where um, where the the switch flipped, and I wasn't gonna accept losing because I'm on international soil. I wasn't gonna make excuses. Um, but I was just going to leave it all out there. And I can remember it happening in a match. Uh, and it was really freeing. It was, uh, it was pretty cool um, for me, at least. Um, and I'm sure other people have experienced that as well. But um, So was um, it a change of expectations or like what was the moment? I mean, where, how, how, how deep into the match were you? Like what did you? Uh, I, think it was, what I think it was the second period. I think it was the second period. I think I lost the first period. Um, like three, I, I, I cannot remember, uh, but I lost it pretty easily. He was digging underhooks on me. I don't know if you've ever seen Chikai wrestle, uh, uh-uh. but he's, he's, he's pretty mean with those underhooks. Um, he had some easy takedowns. And then I, I remember I shot a double leg in the second period. And uh, somewhere in that, that attack, and when I got my hands on the legs, I was just thinking, I'm, I'm getting points here. And, and I ran him off the mat. Uh, and then that's where that, that switch flipped. And I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm in it for the long haul here. And uh, he's just going to wrestle. Let's go. <laughs> that's uh, it. Let's I love go. that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. No. Now, it was cool. as we, uh, as we kind of wind things down, I'd love to understand, you know, like right before the match or maybe 10 minutes out before the match, were you someone who you were – trying to clear your mind and stay loose or did you have like a, a pre-match mantra you said you said to yourself so like maybe you're in the hole like what, what was going through your mind at those times um I think it changed from year to year as you you see what works for you there were times where I was just telling myself all right you're gonna win you're gonna win you're gonna win and then there were times where I was just saying um I'm gonna keep my hands moving my feet moving keep attacking attack within the first mm-hmm. 30 seconds but little little reminders like that that are easy to forget but if you just focus uh, too broadly sometimes it's hard to 
to uh, execute. But if you if you generalize and focus on a couple things, then I've had a lot of success with that. Just hands and feet moving, keep attacking. Hands and feet moving, keep attacking. And uh, uh, so I think it's it, it's changed over the years. I think that's well, that was my 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 mentality towards the later part of my career. And the the thing that's interesting about that is you hear like Snyder after he lost his dad July F. He's like, my goal is not to win or lose. My goal is to get the most out of myself. So it's interesting mm-hmm. to hear someone who's, and I know we've all seen that interview, but you know it's interesting mm-hmm. to hear someone who's at that level who's not thinking about winning and losing. Whereas, yeah, kind of growing up where we grew up, the Iowa style, it seemed like it was all about winning and losing. So like, how do you balance mm-hmm. that with your athletes now? Do you, do you have a conversation about that or is it something I have to figure out on their own? Uh, Yes and no. Um, the only times I'm ever upset with our athletes uh, is when the effort isn't there. If the effort's there and they're, they're wrestling as hard as they can and, and trying to have fun and score a lot of points, then I'll, I'll never be upset with them. Um, right. So I think, I think wrestling to score uh, and really leaving it all out there, I think, I think that's kind of what we try to uh, – to, to, to say to them, um, to have fun, you know, to, to, to be relaxed, to score points. I think if, if you start to shut down or lock up, that's, uh, that's the kind of stuff we want to avoid. Right. Right. Yeah. Wrestling is free and, and open. Um, yeah. so I, I know, yeah, you, know, you have a your busy schedule, you have a kid and you know, you're coaching it. So I just want to kind of wrap things up with, with three quick questions here. Then we'll let you go, man. Does that sound fair? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So when you were a kid, like who was someone you looked up to or try to try to model yourself after? Like who were your, some of your early wrestling heroes? Um, to be honest, I wasn't like one of those crazy wrestle heads. I didn't, I didn't follow the sport a ton. Um, cause I did it so much that, when I had some freedom, I was, I was taking, taking a step away from it. Um, okay. so I really didn't have that a lot, even when I was in college and, um, after college, I never wanted to put anyone else on the pedestal. So I wasn't like, I wasn't years out of college going to the NCAA tournament because, uh, all these guys coming through are going to be my competition and I don't, I don't care about them. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of a bad person to ask. Uh, when it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know if that's because I'm so competitive, but uh, um, I think I remember there's something to that. that? I think there's something to that because, you know, if if you, if you do, when you step away and you're kind of free from it, maybe you go into it fresher than someone who's kind of always obsessing about it or is like a true fan of the sport. Like they said, Alex Rodriguez, he would always watch baseball all the time. Whereas Jeter, he would like never watch baseball. He wasn't a fan of yeah. it as much as like he was a professional. He was in and out, you know, so yeah. both ways. But yeah, and and that was my mentality. Uh, I, uh, I I can understand why I did it um, as a kid because you know I, I I put so much pressure on myself that I, I wanted to get away from it. And there were times where I hated the sport. Uh, I think once I once I got to high school, um, you know, those pressures started to to extinguish themselves because because I, I was appreciating it and enjoying it a lot more when I was a little older. Um, but even right. so, you know, once I started doing it as as my full time living, I, uh, I I really distanced myself when I was not practicing and when I was not competing, unless it was uh, you know while I was at Michigan, if it was watching those Michigan guys or uh, watching my uh, brother in law David compete, I was. I was right. not not up to date as much as uh, a lot of these other wrestling fans. Which some people would find that hard to believe, but I I can understand uh, can understand where you're coming from. Um, yeah. The, it, the next. Go ahead. No, no, no. You're good. I was gonna say the next question is, you know, growing up in Illinois like we did, University of Iowa was kind of the end all be all. Maybe not for you, but for a lot of kids in the state, it was. Like, what's it like probably squaring off against the Brands Brothers as a coach, man? Because your guy, uh, Rivera, stud, you took mm-hmm. out Lee twice this yeah. year. What's that experience yeah. like coaching against those guys? Um, I don't really think about it, you know. There's, there's, right. 
there's coaches uh, that will coach the ref, and there's coaches that will coach the other coaches. Uh, I'm not a fan of that. I try not to do it. I try not to say things to the ref to um, sway them, but there are little little things that you got to do um, because everyone else is doing them. I think uh, what I try to focus on though is is just making sure I'm coaching my guy and making sure I'm staying in the moment and I'm not getting, getting caught up uh, emotionally with, you know, all the other drama that goes, goes on uh, the sidelines. So those, those are, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm, I'm just purely there to coach my guys. And, um, Right. You know, if there's certain, if there's certain times where you got to make the ref aware that that, that someone's doing something, uh, yeah, I'll do that. But I, I I try to avoid it as much as I can. And and looking back on your career, I and mean, we always wrap up with this question: is yeah, you know, how has wrestling uh, you know, changed or impacted your life? Like, what are some of the things you take take away from the sport even now? Yeah. So it's it's kind of funny. I I always wanted to get away from the sport. Um, in college, I wanted to win the national title and be done. I wanted to work outside of the sport and see what else I can do. And then um, ultimately, I spent seven years after college trying to make a world and Olympic team. So uh, after that, I, I wanted to get out, away from the sport again. I wanted to see what else was out there and, and get a job and make some money. And um, I did that for, for maybe a year. I was trading futures. And uh, and I'm, I'm back in it again. I think uh, as much as I try to leave, I, I realize how much I enjoy it and appreciate it. Um, and now that I'm done training and now I'm coaching, it's, it's a complete new experience for me. And it's, it's so much fun. Makes me wish I had some more time to, to compete. Um, and that goes, that goes by so quickly. And that, that's life in general. Um, and every day I wake up and I get to hang out with these college kids and, you know, help them become better wrestlers and help, help them to become better people, be better men. Um, it's fun. It's, 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 it's not work when, when you're having fun. And, uh, right. and that's my job right now. And, I, and, and I, it, there, there's times where it's very time consuming, but, um, I think, uh, I think when I think I'm in a fortunate position where I don't dread going to work on a Sunday or a Monday or a Tuesday because I'm doing something I love. And uh, I think there's probably a lot of people that, that don't get to experience that type of living. Um, so I'm, I'm just grateful every day uh, for the sport because of that. I and I could have a lot of people don't feel that way. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. You, and that's yeah. awesome. You, you can appreciate that. What one question I have just as a follow up is, what about it has made you maybe wish you could still compete just now that you're a full-time coach, just like the general appreciation for the sport? Yeah. I mean, um, I think when, I'm, when you're in the moment and you're competing and you're focused on that, it's tough to really appreciate how enjoyable it is to, to step on the mat and have everyone watching you and get your hand raised. And now I see my guys experiencing that. I see these guys uh, still internationally that I've beaten. Um, performance well and it, it, it makes me wonder you know had I continued to to wrestle but um I don't know I, I think there's always that that uh I think any competitive wrestler probably thinks that they can still do it uh, so any I, I don't think we'll see you next year at the trials <laughs> uh, I don't know maybe I think about oh maybe okay yeah don't 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 put too much uh, credence into that but it's, uh, it's always fun to think about. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Well, Jimmy, thank you so much for your time, brother. Uh, long time I've you know, known the name and, and followed your career, so appreciate you stopping by today. Thank you. Absolutely. Appreciate uh, you having me on, and I uh, wish you the best. That's the end of this episode, but definitely not the end of the show. For more episodes, please go to wrestlingchangemylife.org. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us a star rating. Show the love, baby. Show the love. Thank you so much. We'll see you again soon. Peace.